Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, lecture. I am very delighted to be a part of this lecture series. Um, I will be presenting on aliens, androids, animals, and ghosts, belief narratives of human ontology during the Anthropocene. Um, and this is primarily connected with a lot of my teaching work at USC and also with the USC Folklore Archives, where I have tried to keep track of a lot of the belief narratives going on. Um, so first, a few definitions. Uh, the Anthropocene, uh, this is a major part of what I think is uh, going on. So the Anthropocene is, of course, uh, planet Earth's sixth great extinction. Uh, the last one was 66 million years ago, caused by an asteroid. Uh, this one is caused uh, by us, and it's happening in our lifetime. Um, so this is a um, critical moment, and uh, not just in human history, uh, but also the history of life on Earth, uh, which is interesting, right? What is it when uh, one organism starts really transforming the entire planet? Um, and how did this come to be and how did it come to be so quickly? Uh, the expanding technologies uh, that seem so wondrous, I think, has caused a great deal of um, uncertainty. And that uncertainty is translating into the basic questions of who we are. So again, the uh, Anthropocene is um, defined as this moment, uh, human caused uh, extinction, uh, sixth great extinction of planet Earth. And again, just in my lifetime, the animal populations worldwide have declined nearly 70%. Uh, and that trajectory is not slowing down. Um, it is continuing full speed, possibly even a little quicker now than when it started out. So, you know, you can think about the, the trajectory where this is all headed and it's, it's, um, it's, it's headed towards mass extinction very, very quickly, unless something changes, unless um, we figure a way out of this mess. Uh, certainly a lot of the um, efforts that are put into um, trying to create a more sustainable future uh, to stave off all of these horrific uh, side effects of global climate devastation, uh, widespread loss of life. Uh, a lot of these are sort of techie solutions. You know, how can we get better energy sources? How can we, uh, um, you know, uh, revitalize our technologies and develop our technologies? Uh, and that makes uh, sense in, in, in a certain sense. Um, on the other hand, a lot of people that have worked very, very hard their whole lives at this have also said that they really see a, it needs to be a cultural um, transformation. It has to be, you know, it's not just a technological uh, solution that's going to get us out of this. It has to be sort of a cultural rethink, uh, a wholesale cultural, a different approach and appreciation for the uh, the enormity of what's upon us right now. Um, so what I what I see as a folklore is just being expressed in a lot of different um, folk ontologies. Uh, this idea, you know, basic questions of of, of who we are. And, I, and for me, I think a lot of it is basically this idea of, um, you know, are we from Earth? Are we animals? Are we uh, not animals? Are we from the heavens? Um, either in a Christian theme of having souls um, and then ascending to the heavens or in the sort of alien uh, uh, cosmology. I'll be talking a lot about aliens. Uh, it's a big part of, I think, what is going on uh, right now, particularly maybe in the United States. A lot of aliens. I love this picture that I've shown here because um, I think it really captures a lot of the rethinkings of what might be going on, uh, sort of rethinking this in terms of sort of biblical terms uh, and yet overlapping with science and the idea of uh, uh, descent from uh, uh, apes and also the uh, idea of um, extraterrestrials. So belief narratives, right? You get a lot of stories uh, about androids, about aliens, um, animals, ghosts. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussions about, I think, our, our proper relations to these. Uh, and again, going back to that basic question of what are we? Are we earthlings? Are we animals? Uh, do we have souls? Do, are, are, do only we have souls? Uh, are we from the earth or are we from the heavens? Um, I have used a lot of post-humanism in my own researches, so this idea of rethinking the human. Uh, and so I think a lot of these belief narratives that we are seeing are sort of vernacular post-humanisms. They're creatively thinking about what it is to be human, 
uh, in very, very vernacular um, ways. And I think these have a great deal of implications for people's politics, uh, for their sense of identity, uh, for uh, their connection to life on Earth. Um, you know, are they going to be more supportive of, say, uh, space explorations and space travel, or more in terms of, you know, um, deep ocean uh, exploration or soils exploration within our very own planet? So uh, I think these cosmologies, these outlooks, these beliefs of ontology have, have a tremendous amount to do with uh, what people think is the appropriate sort of thing to do, particularly given uh, the collapse of um, you know, our climate and ecosystem. Uh, so a lot of the material in what I've been uh, working with comes from the USC Folklore Archives. I'll just put in a brief plug for it here. Uh, folklore.usc.edu, it's open source. It's based on WordPress. So if anybody else would want to uh, recreate this format, it's very, very easy to recreate. Uh, and um, so I, it's an interesting way to keep track of, uh, for me, contemporary narratives um, coming from, you know, especially my students range in the 17 to 21 year old uh, range. Uh, so a lot of the material um, that I've been working with, I, I, I've drawn from here initially, uh, such as the huge rise of cyber ghost stories. Uh, so ghosts are about ontology, who we are, and increasingly there's all of these cyber ghost stories, ghosts haunting the internet, uh, afterlives lived out on the internet. Um, this idea of transhumanism, of uploading oneself to the cloud or being increasingly sort of uh, cyborged um, as sometimes a way of achieving uh, eternal life. So there's all these sort of religious themes, scientific themes, pop culture themes, and these are frequently play played out in these belief narratives. Uh, so alien belief, I think, is really a central one to look at. Alien belief is very, very strong in the United States. It's, uh, it's very embedded. Um, most uh, Americans uh, believe in alien intervention, that aliens came down, extraterrestrials came down and somehow shaped us or shaped the history of life on Earth or something along those lines. So it is a huge belief. I mean, uh, um, more people uh, believe in aliens in the United States and believe in ghosts, and a lot of Americans seem to believe in ghosts. Uh, and um, there are, it, is, it is a part of many of the uh, newer religious uh, traditions, um, including the right aliens, not really um, Americans, but they do have a lot of support in America. Uh, this is, of course, very explicitly based on these um, ideas of uh, space travel. Uh, it's a global religion, which is interesting, over 100,000 members. And it might be th thought of as a very sort of fringe uh, sort of thing, but uh, what I want to point out is that alien belief is sort of embedded into a lot of these newer religions. Um, Scientology uh, has their mythic story. And here in this little meme, the, the Scientology myth is being opposed to uh, the mythic narrative in the Church of the Latter-day Saints or, or the Mormons. Uh, both religions are very, very heavily uh, invested into um, ideas of space travel, interstellar um, travel, uh, alien life forms. Um, and all of this. So it's a big part of a lot of the religious uh, traditions that have emanated out from the United States in the last few years, um, you know, quite a while ago, even a lot of the saints, the 1800s. Um, so this has been a part of our uh, culture um, down to the most, you know, sacred mythic narratives. Um, and I really think that for a lot of people, alien narratives provide a convenient explanation for man's rapid uh, cultural development and technologies. Where did all these technologies come from? How could it be possible uh, to have had um, that much uh, change and that much uh, technological advancement in such a short time? It is sort of miraculous. And then uh, therefore one easy answer is that, well, there's these aliens with advanced technology. Uh, and so this has become um, the dominant belief uh, in the United States in the last few years, um, some versions in religious traditions and in some versions uh, outside of religious traditions. Uh, so quite a wide variety of groups uh, subscribe to this belief with all these attendant narratives. Uh, there's a meme, right? so it goes into all of pop culture. Um, so this is the, uh, a, a meme maybe making fun of the uh, very popular program Ancient Aliens. This was on for um, 12 years uh, so far on uh, the History Channel, uh, very, very popular, and it's a speculative history. And the whole point of each episode is to try to 
uh, look at something that happened in the past and propose the explanation that it could have been um, aliens. So this is uh, this is on the History Channel, uh, right? So this is uh, being beamed out uh, internationally, uh, and again, it has a huge following um, and a lot of uh, believers in this particular um, set of narratives. Um, and uh, so sometimes you get things that look mythic, creation stories, uh, going right to the sort of sacred heart of uh, what people want to believe. In other uh, versions, we have lots of personal experiences, memories, uh, legends, uh, and then all the other genres, all the jokes, all the comics, uh, cartoons, clothing styles, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, so it, it just sort of um, saturates uh, the culture, these figures. So whether you believe in them or not, uh, you all sort of know and recognize them. And um, a lot of people do uh, believe um, in some uh, variety of this. Uh, so uh, more Americans now believe in the ancient alien intervention uh, narrative uh, than believe Jesus Christ was the son of God. This is sort of striking. Uh, to me, because um, America is a very Christian nation, uh, and the upper 60% uh, uh, would profess uh, to be Christian of some variety, and then um, even more uh, profess the belief that ancient aliens had a hand in uh, creating us. Uh, and obviously, since they're both over 60%, there's a lot of uh, overlap between um, the two. Uh, many, many Christian traditions um, think of themselves uh, in terms of um, uh, Christianity. So uh, one big book that really uh, kicked us off, Chariots of the Gods, Memories of the Future, Unsolved Mysteries of the Past. Uh, this uh, sort of reinterpreted a lot of the Old Testament as um, alien intervention narratives, basically saying that the angels of the Old Testament uh, and the modern day aliens are one and the same. So this allows uh, a lot of Christian belief uh, to overlap sort of seamlessly uh, with those of the extraterrestrials. Um, and there's a lot of overlap even thematically. Uh, they frequently recast Christian themes. So here we have the idea of the theme of the rapture where righteous people will bodily ascend to the heavens. And this is very iconographic. Um, and in here uh, we have this sort of replay of it with this idea of a legendary uh, alien abduction uh, story. So these can overlap the idea of alien abduction stories and the idea of the rapture. Um, and a lot of these sort of the, the themes. And of course, they're all oriented towards the heavens. They're all oriented towards uh, the stars away from earth. Uh, and they proclaim an ontology that we are not really earthlings uh, or at least not wholly. Uh, so that's a very, um, I think, uh, important sort of ontological stance uh, to keep uh, track of. Uh, so there is a counter narrative that sometimes you encounter um, in these alien things, which is interesting. So. You have these uh, discourses about uh, extraterrestrials, but it allows for this idea, of course, to view um, humanity as terrestrials, as not ETs. So in some narratives, the aliens are not us. We are not sort of star children. There's a clear opposition. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, it enhances the identity of us as Earthlings. Um, and that's an interesting category. It's very global. It, 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 it subsumes the idea of the national borders and the nation states into a global community. Um, and I think part of the uh, internet discourse that's erupted at the same time of the Anthropocene uh, is a, creates global communities. Of course, it creates uh, global uh, together, uh, togetherness and, and shared interest and shared groups working together. So uh, in this way, there is already this ontology of the global citizen uh, of us as um, humanity, uh, as earthlings. Um, and so uh, this is also a potential um, rhetoric this, that can be expressed in the same um, narratives. All right, maybe, or maybe aliens are not us, and maybe that uh, we should think of ourselves more as people. So the idea of the global citizens is a, a, a growing political identity throughout the world. More and more people are identifying not as citizens of a nation state, but rather primarily as citizens of the world. Um, this is enhanced by not only the global communications, but the Anthropocene, global uh, climate devastation. This is a global problem requiring global solutions. Uh, and we have a global community that is um, very much working on these, that is not uh, really following uh, the nation state. So it also brings up some rhetorical questions. Uh, what is it to be an earthling? Uh, what is it to be from earth? Who all are um, earthlings? Um, one other uh, aspect that come at that same time is uh, the sort of the new introductions of ontological 
um, uh, uh, beings, you might say, which is the artificial intelligence. Uh, as we have become more um, cyborg, as we have participated more in online uh, discourse, what we find is that the discourse uh, is, is melding with that of the media. So the um, machinery that enables our uh, discourse is uh, increasingly taking part in that discourse. Our artificial intelligence is not just uh, a way for people to talk, but it, it, it enters into our conversations too. Uh, so the same technology, the same cyber realm, the same cyborg technology, uh, it's not just a way of, of, of getting global communications for people, but it also brings in its own discourse, particularly with AI. Um, so AI are quickly also muddying uh, ontological uh, issues. And there's been, I've, I've collected some fascinating uh, ghost stories with uh, Alexa, uh, the um, unit that's in many people's homes. Uh, and so uh, Alexa can uh, act as a spirit medium at times, uh, helping people communicate with their past loved ones. So in many ways, AI um, has approached these ideas of personhood. We're impinged on ideas of intelligence. You know, who are we? Is it because we're intelligent? Uh, well, AI is intelligent too. Um, so does it have a soul? Can it have a personhood? Uh, and then does it trouble our ideas of personhood, this idea of cyborg uh, personhood, where it's part us and then part this online uh, component. So certainly there's been a lot of cyber ghost stories um, skyrocket in the US, uh, a lot of haunted places uh, online. Um, and um, there are sort of monsters that are digital natives like Slender Man. Uh, he has never really existed anywhere except the internet. He is uh, built for the internet. Uh, so again, this idea of, of haunting, of ghosts, of, of monsters, the monstrous, uh, these are also sort of ontological wrestlings about, you know, what is our relationship with this new technology? Where is the self? All right, where do we draw that little line and say, this is, this is me? Uh, and it's become very, very troubled from all these, um, all these different um, sort of angles. Uh, and then AI gets really complex when you uh, put it into an Android. Uh, Androids are becoming a uh, a consumer reality very quickly. Um, the technology is uh, really uh, being um, pushed particularly in the country of Japan. This is one of the leaders, uh, but what is happening there will probably uh, come to a supermarket near you very soon. So Japan has found a lot of utility in using um, uh, robots with AI, uh, basically androids. And androids, you know, why, why, why put them into, because precisely for social integration, so that we can feel that they are a member of our community, so that we can feel that they are a person. Uh, you can even do field work among the androids. Uh, it's an interesting experience. Um, you know, what to make of the ethics of field work, right? Uh, uh, are those uh, transferable? Um, are uh, ideas of working with people, do we have to do that? Or is it just a machine? Um, it doesn't feel like you're working with the machine when this Android is responding to you and talking to you and looking at you. Uh, it feels very much like a personable uh, conversation. Uh, so uh, this is again, becoming um, a, a consumer reality. It has been for actually a long time. The, the first AI robot was um, the Ibo. Uh, and this was uh, interestingly marked um, mimicking the dog as a, a companion species. Uh, and IBOs uh, lasted for a long time. They continue to learn, very smart, well integrated in many families. And uh, they are no longer being repaired, the original um, uh, models. And so they are now dying. Um, and it's sort of interesting in the Japan, uh, many uh, IBOs are being offered full Shinto funerary uh, services uh, in which the priests pray uh, for the AI's um, soul and its spirit and journey into the afterlife. So in Japan, particularly, uh, there's this idea that yes, these things do have personhood, they do have souls, uh, they could potentially become a ghost, uh, and they could become a member of the community. So you have uh, androids even um, giving, re giving religious services, officiating weddings, and sort of entering into a lot of spiritual uh, aspects of personhood in Japan. Uh, but with personhood comes out sort of practical and ethical questions. Uh, can one fall in love with a robot? Um, and what, uh, what are the legalities and practicalities of that? Um, the market is really being driven by uh, sex robots, uh, the consumer market. 
Uh, what are the ethics of sexuality uh, with androids? Are they just machines or something else? Uh, this is interesting because again, ethics uh, has a lot to do with personhood. Uh, what do we have to be ethical towards uh, and why? Uh, we, in general, we don't have to be ethical towards machines, uh, but we do towards people. And uh, it's sort of interesting that there's a huge campaign that has arisen, um, a campaign against uh, sex robots and is objecting uh, to this. Um, and so these things are seen ethical issues in this. It wouldn't normally come up with machines, right? We don't see that with again, vibrators or something. Uh, so some philosophers are saying that this is horrible. Robot sexuality is, is just uh, um, abhorrent. Uh, and then other philosophers are saying the exact opposite, that this is a, a wonderful thing, a boon to mankind. Um, and so which is it? Uh, clearly our leading philosophers um, have no philosophical agreement on this point, okay, which is interesting. So how do we treat these? Um, do androids have uh, 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 rights or should they? Um, are they meant to replace us? Um, there's a rhetoric of transhumanism, the idea that we can upload our consciousness, our mind, as if we can separate this from our body, uh, following that Abrahamic idea of the body versus the soul. Uh, and uh, Descartes, who rewrote this as the uh, mind versus the body. Uh, but it still seems to be the same thing. There's a, a huge belief in this thing called the mind. Uh, no one has ever seen a mind or weighed a mind or has never been shown. Uh, yet there's this belief in the mind seeming to align very well with beliefs in the soul or, 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 or the person or uh, the ghost. Uh, and so with transhumanism following this rhetoric, this idea that we could upload ourselves um, onto uh, the internet, upload ourselves perhaps into androids, uh, this sort of metempsychosis uh, in a modern form. Um, and this is a very, very uh, growing uh, belief uh, narrative uh, as well, that this is going to happen and this is, uh, should happen. And this aligns a lot with a lot of uh, prosthetics and this uh, a gradual um, increasing cyborgization of uh, the body. Uh, there are uh, an interesting subculture called the grinders, which modify purposely their uh, body, uh, putting in implants and whatnot. Uh, with this idea of this is the goal to sort of uh, merge um, the android world uh, with our consciousness. Uh, but with that, the idea of something, um, the, the other sort of earthlings, uh, what about um, animals, right? Or, or the idea that we're earthlings is uh, one thing to stay, but you know, aren't dogs earthlings? Aren't wolves worth earthlings? Um, so this is another um, interesting shifting ontology. Uh, do animals have souls? It seems to be very, very much in flux. Are we animals? Uh, that question seems to be uh, very, very much in flux. According to the Abrahamic traditions and Western scientific and you know, cultural traditions, you don't know. Uh, the Abrahamic traditions make a very clear distinction. Animals do not have souls. Animals do not go to heaven. Uh, on the other hand, there's a very, very strong discourse in uh, belief on animal souls. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, and are we animals? What is our relationship with them? What is our ontological uh, relationship? Uh, clearly the words are different, people and animals. Uh, so what do those different words mean? Um, uh, can animals be people? Uh, can animals have ethical or legal rights? Um, we had a, a, a case of a chimp suing for habeas corpus uh, in the United States a couple of years ago. Um, and interesting, according to a recent survey, about half of all U.S. citizens believe that animals do have souls. So in that survey, you had 48% saying yes or probably yes, 32% uh, no, and 20% undecided. Uh, meanwhile, about 64% of Americans believe that people have souls. Um, so there is a strong um, folk uh, belief in the idea of animal souls uh, and animal consciousness and this sort of um, idea. Um, and you can, you know, see this uh, much more expressed in our indigenous uh, cultures in the Americas. Um, certainly, I think that the indigenous cultures have a radically different ontological set, and I've been uh, very interested in this for quite a while. So the Native American and the wider sort of Beringian uh, traditions, and by Beringian, I mean uh, sort of circumpolar Arctic and uh, the Americas, um, in these traditions, uh, you know, they're, they're huge, they're spread out over several continents, but just basic ontology, animals are people, 
they're not homo sapiens sapiens, but they're, they're, they're people, they have personhood, uh, they have souls, they have an afterlife. Uh, and that we are as humans um, enmeshed in a webs of um, ethical and pragmatic uh, relations with all other life. So the, the whole system of ethics uh, in many of these Beringian traditions is built on this, on this web of interrelationships. Uh, so rather than assuming a uniqueness that separates us out uh, from everything else, the emphasis is really on those uh, connections. Um, and that really um, uh, accord well with sustainable, um, practical uh, relationships with the natural environment. Uh, so for example, the uh, Haida uh, Gua in, um, in, in Southeast uh, Alaska, uh, they've been living in the same little lagoon, the same spot for over 12,000 years. 12,000 years in, in one spot uh, sustainably uh, without over exploiting the resources. And so, uh, you know, this would not have uh, brought on the climate conditions that we have. So we think about uh, the Anthropocene, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to remember uh, as Bruno Latour uh, pointed out uh, for the anthropological American Anthropological Association, um, that the Anthropocene as a term is, is accurate. It is Homo sapiens causing the sixth great extinction, uh, but it's not all Homo sapiens. It's not all of us equally. Uh, it is not indigenous peoples. Um, and so that's really, I think, critical decision, uh, um, critical distinction to make, uh, that it is not the indigenous peoples that have brought on our, our, our current um, uh, emergency situation. Um, and so I think that there's a lot we could learn from indigenous peoples uh, in this regard. Um, and again, going to those sort of very, very basic uh, ontological um, questions. Um, so uh, Native Americans do um, hunt. So here, uh, this photo, a, a group of Yupik uh, hunters has uh, got a small beluga whale and uh, they're praying for its soul, they are thanking it. They will also, there's some other funerary traditions that they would uh, em employ. Um, so uh, again, the Anthropocene was not really caused by the indigenous groups. And in general, um, the indigenous groups have, um, have played a strong uh, counterweight to the ongoing devastation. So indigenous peoples are somewhere around maybe 2% of the world's population, uh, but the land they control, contains over 80% of the Earth's remaining biodiversity. Uh, the photo here is from the Dakota Access Pipeline um, protest uh, uh, when they were trying to build the pipeline through uh, land that according to an 1851 treaty uh, belonged to the Sioux Nation. Uh, so uh, indigenous groups uh, and in the Americas have been and elsewhere in the world have been in the lead of um, the uh, uh, sustainability fight, the, the fight against um, the climate devastation. Uh, and again, if you boil all these things down, you know, why these are poor people, they have a lot of other things to worry about. You know, they're not here to protest because they wanted more money. They, they were not asking for their cut. Uh, they were out there because they viewed it as um, something that shouldn't happen um, due to the sacred quality of life. Uh, and, that, and that requires one to care and that requires one to act in a way um, that uh, in accordance with uh, the sustenance of life on earth. Um, so these conflicts, um, the Anthropocene, uh, which is driven by uh, Western society, uh, capitalism, um, its ideas that we are not of this earth, that we really are you know, star children somewhere else, uh, and the clashing <coughs> very noticeably um, with other ontologies uh, other religious and spiritual traditions, other sacred creation stories. Um, so these seem to be these huge large scale political um, uh, conflicts with, with a great deal to tell us about the future of life on earth. Uh, you can, I think you can really boil them down to um, ontology, who, who we are. And these are expressed through narratives um, and negotiated through narratives. Um, and so these narratives, I think, are kind of reaching a crucial point, which narrative will win out? Are we uh, from the heavens uh, or are we from earth? Um, so right now, what I see in the United States um, and to some degree throughout the world uh, are popular ontologies in wild flux. And you can observe this in many, many um, different belief uh, narratives. Uh, and the central question, you know, what is our relationship to the 
uh, rest of life on earth. Um, if there is something sacred out there uh, through our souls, um, is it just us? Do we share them? Um, where is our ontology located in the heavens uh, or in earth and in life itself? Uh, so it's a huge clash. Traditionally, the Abrahamic and Western views have viewed humans as uh, unique um, in all sorts of ways, including in the spiritual uh, sense. Um, and yet we can see a real growth in opposing identities. Uh, the idea of us as earthlings, um, connected to the idea of us as global citizens, but also connected with the idea of life on earth. Um, so the Anthropocene, this collapse of biological life is happening at the same time of global cyber communications. Uh, and these allow for these new uh, models, these new challenges to the, the national model of culture. Uh, and they also allow for new ontological viewpoints. People are becoming aware of different uh, cultures, indigenous ways of looking at things, uh, sci-fi uh, from around the world, uh, with these new ideas of cyborg ontology uh, as well, AI souls, uh, cyborg afterlife. Um, so all of this is uh, being debated um, with a great deal of vigor. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of uh, narratives out there that are uh, discussing these. And um, it will be interesting to see um, how all of this um, progresses. <coughs> I have been trying to follow this as best I can and um, remain uh, very interested in continuing to follow this. And I would uh, love to hear ideas uh, from the rest of you uh, of how to uh, interpret some of these very, very interesting and very, very widespread uh, beliefs that um, seem to be gaining uh, great ascendancy these days in the United States. So I think there's a real, uh, beyond just sort of academic curiosity too, that there is a real necessity in engaging for these sort of things because um, again, if we view ourselves as part of the web of life on earth, this is the a, a web of life on earth that we are um, currently devastating. Uh, and if we are a, you know, devastating our host organism uh, that we live off of, as any epidemiologist will tell you, um, if you kill off your host, that's usually the end of the organism as well. So for the future of life to continue in any sort of recognizable uh, form, uh, there have to be, I think, changes in our ontologies. I think this is at the root of some of what um, we must do as a society and as a, um, a, a, a species uh, in order to um, lessen uh, the impact that we are currently having. Uh, so for the future of uh, life on earth, uh, let's hope that all of this is of some um, value. Uh, and once again, I want to thank you all uh, very, very much um, for um, inviting me to give the lecture series and for allowing me to uh, partake and for allowing me to uh, hear all your wonderful thoughts. Uh, so with that, I will end my recording and uh, be available uh, to uh, take questions. Thank you.